Good afternoon, good morning. Um, dear distinguished uh, participants, viewers, um, panelists, my name is uh, Victoria Walker. I'm an assistant director at DCAP, Geneva Center for Security Sector Governance. It's a great pleasure to be back at the World Bank Fragility Forum, which remains a key date in our calendars to pause for reflection and develop greater insights in how we collectively look at and work on peace and development. So in this session, which is co-hosted by the G7 Plus and, and DCAF, we're inviting you to share in a dialogue that draws out concrete examples as we look at what is on the surface, a long-standing concept, um, the importance of national ownership. But it's one that it's very timely to review now. And you know, how have our understandings of the importance of this key principle evolved? Taking into account the dilemmas, the trade-offs, the tensions that, that this concept implies and what really needs to happen to achieve it and why, what has worked and where do we still need to uh, improve. So just to say a couple of things on a quick, some quick words on the co-organizers of the session. Um, so the G7 Plus is an intergovernmental organization of 20 conflict affected countries um, that aims at achieving peace and stability. And the group promotes nationally owned dialogue and reconciliation and approaches to engagement in fragile states. And it's one that is premised on national ownership and, uh, and context. And the G7 Plus, along with OECD DAC donors and civil society, agreed on the New Deal for engagement in fragile states um, just after the, uh, the WDR came out in 2011. And security and access to justice are recognized as two of the five peace building and state building goals in the New Deal. So the G7 Plus is currently chaired by Sierra Leone, and in that capacity, we're also very happy to have His Excellency Mr. Amaro Napoleon Caromo, Prime Deputy Minister of Justice from Sierra Leone, as, uh, as one of the panelists. And then as an organization, DCAF is dedicated to making states and people safer through more effective and accountable security and justice. And since 2000, the center has facilitated, driven, and shaped security sector reform policy, and programming around the world and supported national actors in this process. So for DCAF, national ownership really is a critical topic. And good security sector governance based on the rule of law and respect for human rights is a cornerstone of development and security. So DCAF assists host states in developing laws, institutions, policies and practices to improve the governance of their security sector through inclusive and participatory reforms based on international norms and good practices. And we also involve, advise international partner governments and international organizations in designing and implementing their own programs for supporting states in developing their security sector governments. So today, as um, across the panelists, I'm joined by His Excellency Mr. Amaru Napoleon Karoma, the Deputy Minister of Justice from Sierra Leone by Major General Chol Bian Gang, the Under Secretary of Defense, uh, the Ministry of Defense for South Sudan, Ms. Muska Dastagir, a professor at the American University of Afghanistan, and Dr. Elizabeth Lace, the head of the Competence Center Rule of Law, Security, Human Rights and Gender in the Deutsche Gesellschaft for Internationale Zusammenbeit, or GIZ. So just first a quick word on the format. So we'll have two rounds of interventions from the panelists, after which we'll take questions submitted from viewers by the chat. So please do use this facility to add to the conversation. So as a very brief introduction, just to remind you what we're looking at here. So national ownership has different dimensions. Security and justice transformation must be grounded on local context and reality. Development must be conceived and developed by the national authorities but also with the active involvement of a full representation of the country's citizens to shape the vision of security and justice, including gender, generational, ethnic, socioeconomic, geographical, and other diversities. It also implies that the international community respects and empowers this broad notion of national ownership, that they engage and support national stakeholders beyond just governments and national and security and justice institutions, and that the implementation of assistance should be aligned with local needs. So vesting ownership in the country undertaking its own reform efforts also enhances engagement and accountability between citizens and the state and considers the views of all sectors of society. So in short, it's complex, especially when looking at the perspective of practical applications on the ground. 
So to start us off in this, in this discussion, if I could call our Excellency Karoma, the Deputy Minister of Justice. So could you share some of your understandings of national ownership from the perspective of Sierra Leone security and justice development? And how important has applying this been actually in the success of, uh, of what you've managed to achieve in, in your country? Excellency, the floor is yours. Thank you for having me on this panel. Let me on behalf of the government of Sierra Leone, the chairing country of the G7 Plus Group, and in particular on behalf of the Minister of Development, Dr. Francis Kaikai, the chair of the G7 Plus, thank the organizers for this all important event. We all may be aware that access to speedy and fair justice and security are at the heart of the G7 Plus agenda. And these are indispensable determinants of sustaining peace, for conflict affected countries, such as those in the G7 plus, access to justice is not only a means of stability, but it is also a basic service that we are committed to delivery. Madam Moderator, I will briefly expound on the importance and value of national ownership, drawing examples from the perspectives of Sierra Leone security and justice development. National leadership and national ownership are essential components of progress and transition towards stability and of peace and development. Broadly speaking, the national ownership question derives from the criticisms of the international development practice that is mostly driven by external actors who facilitate development and reform initiatives that do not, in most cases, adequately reflect local needs and dynamics. But pertinent to this national ownership discourse, I'll invite you to consider three gaps that are key to the security and justice development. These are data, finance, data financing and implementation. To start with the data gap. This undermines the ability to understand the problem and evidence on what works to address prevailing injustices and security concerns. According to the Justice for All report, the global justice gap affects over 5.1 billion people who do not have meaningful access to justice. This includes people who live in situations of extreme justice, in situation of extreme injustices, such as war, modern slavery, or statelessness. Those who do not have their papers in order, no birth certificate, no ownership of their land or house, or no contract for their work. This is an example of instances where the use of data can provide information on justice that people want and need and the justice they receive. This is critical to the development of security and justice. The financing gap, this calls for serious investment in increased justice because of its cross cut in nature. In low income countries such as ours, it costs around 20 United States dollars per person per year to provide basic access to justice services. The implementation gap, this deals or concerns seven people's justice problems and preventing them. It starts by empowering people and communities to take action to tackle justice problems when they arise make services available to them that are responsive to their needs and to find traditional approaches to solving justice problems. Madam Moderator, the principle of national ownership emphasizes the need for development policies, institutions, and activities for reform of any sector in a given country to be designed, to be designed, managed, and implemented by domestic actors. Let me, at this point, provide some perspectives from the Sri Lanka experience. In Sri Lanka, we've experienced local ownership and leadership. For instance, in the setting up of the UN Special Court for Sri Lanka, we are keen to have a special court designed for our local needs of justice. We ensured that the court was situated in Sri Lanka as a hybrid system to run concurrently with our domestic courts, which tried offenses such as rape, um, gender-based violence cases, which was not taken up at the international criminal tribunals at the time. The approach ensured judicial accountability to address impunity in as so far as those offenses were concerned. Also realize the importance of the use of data 
to understand the problems of justice in the, at the national level. Therefore, through the support of the IDL, for example, to the Justice Coordinating Office, we recently conducted a justice needs survey for rural women and persons with disabilities. This will help us to allocate resources. We are also using a web-based tool to track access to local court. This system has revealed challenges in some areas in access and justice. Thank you very, thank you very much, Deputy Minister. Much appreciated. Um, we'll now so we'll now move over to um, to Major General Chol Bian Gang. Now, South Sudan obviously has a much younger history. So, what has national ownership meant in shaping the vision of security and justice for the for your country? What measures have been undertaken to ensure that voices from the, the grassroots are, take, are taken into account? And how have you managed to institutionalize this approach? And how have you created a willingness within state institutions to take the voices into account? General, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, Victor, Victoria, and uh, thank for inviting me to this forum. I'm happy to be with you today, G7 Plus. This is my first uh, day with you. And South Sudan is a new country uh, that came out of war 20 to 21 years of war. The national ownership is the responsibility of both the state and the civil, uh, and civil society. Uh, for us in South Sudan, security now is the paramount. People need services to be given to the people. People need justice. People need services to go to all the citizens of this country. Uh, the ownership of the of uh, response, the, the, the national ownership in this country, in South Sudan especially, we, after the war, we have only two years of independence. And on the December 2013, the war erupted inside the country. That was a political war between the same people of the same party. That war took the country back. The development did not take place. And we thank the region, IGAD, AU. Immediately they came in and tried to advise parties, that is the government and the rebels to come to the table. That was the in other areas in the region. So, there was uh, stability, people came together, and then there was a talk. Again, on 2016, the same group came again with a new fight. It was also followed by IGAT and the African Union and the neighboring countries, especially Sudan, so that uh, peace was done in Sudan, and we are now following uh, this peace. We in South Sudan, especially that I'm presenting today, the Minister of Defense, we respect human rights, we respect rule of law, implementing Chapter three of the agreement and purely responsibility of the army so that human, humanitarian access are open 
so that the relief go to affected people. Services can also reach people. Those who are dis displaced, we want them to go back home to their areas of origin. So we are trying our level best to make our citizen and civil population to have rest. It is the responsibility of this government of national unity to bring people together and try to make development in the country. Uh, that's the steps that we are taking implementing the revitalized peace agreement in the spirit and letter. So I think that is the responsibility of the government today and our responsibility as the army, we are implementing uh, chapter three of the agreement that is purely a security uh, for the peace. Thank you, General. Thank you very much. And I think that's sort of that difference of the 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 you know longer term that we've seen from Sierra Leone, and then the sort of slight difference sort of a new country coming up is already creating some of these the, these areas that would be interesting to look into into the uh, in, in the the questions um, as we as we carry on into the into the session. Um, so now I'd like to turn to uh, to Muska, please, um, because. I mean, there's sometimes a tendency to play lip service to inclusion and, and wider national ownership, you know, just by ensuring that there are some representatives of civil society that have been consulted um, and often just consulted in, in name. Um, so looking back, I mean, what lessons were learned in Afghanistan when it comes to how reform processes were planned and, you know, how the way in which support was provided by the international community? Thanks. So uh, thank you, Victoria. So I think I'm going to take a, an improvement orientation in the way I answer the question. And in doing so, I'll, I, I think it'll amply come across um, what some of the mistakes were. Um, if we conceive of Afghanistan as one case, then I think it confirms quite well how difficult it is to operationalize local ownership in a post-war society. Enmities were still very much in force um, in 2001, the year of the inter international intervention. No process of reconciliation was begun. So every, everything easily became um, an arena for the continuation of hostile ethnic political contest, not with outright violence this time, but through relentless patronage, patronage politics. Um, there continued to be a fight for control over the state. How through a competition for donor funding, a competition for positions, for contracts. So in this kind of environment, local ownership um, can mean that a key new arena for hostile contest um, co uh, comes about where it can play out. Um, and, and this, in you know, having studied Afghanistan, uh, having worked there, this is what we saw within the central um, administration, complex and very inimical political economies developing and taking deep root, especially within security institutions. These organizations receive lots of unmonitored funding, de, de facto unmonitored funding. And in my experience, the functional objectives of security institutions um, what they existed to provide um, in terms of civil, uh, in terms of service delivery, um, these became secondary, while the practice of rent seeking actually became primary. Um, the institutions almost became battlegrounds between different elite patronate networks, um, and and this was a vexing issue in Afghanistan, one that never went away for the full 20 years of the um, Republic. So, so how could the international community have mitigated that? Well, there was a leap, quite a considerable jump from the phase of active conflict to uh, purportedly post-conflict institution, institution building or state building. And I think the rush of that left this huge gash or rupture uh, in the fabric of society unmended from the years of the Civil War in the 90s. Um, uh, and just the first, uh, you know, the first uh, emirate of the Taliban. Um, and, and I really have to pause and linger here just at the absurdity of this. 
to begin to begin the social engineering project of state building in the context of a war shattered country where there are deep communal level grievances and distrust, it makes very little logical uh, sense. The scope for unintended um, harm, as you can imagine, would have been and was and proved to be really um, enormous. On the other hand, reconciliation in Afghanistan would not have been and it will not be a matter of months or a couple of years. It's going to be a very long process. Um, and you can't hold off on working towards functional statehood security, access to justice, and other you know, crucial service delivery for the duration of a reconciliation process. So you can easily argue on the basis of all of this that the question of how you ensure local ownership is left unanswered. But I do think there are a few certainties that can be drawn from the Afghan case. For one, I think a penetrating understanding of context is crucial. What might have looked like local ownership to outsiders, um, others would argue was actually externally facilitated empowerment of the few at the expense of the many. It was taking the side of one warring party, installing them in security ministries and allowing them with the full operational capacity of NATO in Afghanistan to brutalize another warring party. Secondly, in my view, having worked with, observed, and evaluated development work in Afghanistan, it's fair to uh, describe the intervention as an instance of liberal peace building. And a mistake often made in liberal peace building, peace building is decision makers and practitioners basing their thinking regarding political progress on narrow conceptions and limited indicators. An example is democracy. Um, thinking of democracy exclusively in terms of episodic uh, elections, that is within a proceduralist frame and ignoring other forms of democratic citizen making in place um, in the process, missing entire forms of potentially democratic or prototypically democratic political engagement, uh, forms of deliberative discourse. An example from the context of Afghanistan is the traditional institution of the Loya Jirga, um, the, the, the large assembly. So instead of looking deeply into Afghanistan and grounding the transnational ambition of wanting to induct Afghanistan into the polite society of international states, um, uh, instead of grounding that in indigenous realities, the international state building effort careened towards creating something like a mirror reality of Western societies. For instance, by arranging elections just a few years into the um, intervention, instead of just stopping up and, and asking what existing fo indigenous forms of participatory political decision-making are actually part of the traditional cultural tapestry here. That was a missed opportunity, I think, for securing genuine local ownership for eliciting assent um, and a key, uh, a key mistake that was made um, um, was the international community coming to rely on a problematic gallery of former um, and current strongmen. Um, it's easy for me to say this, and others have made the point repeatedly, um, it, it's easy for me to say this in 2022, um, when in 2001, that was the cast of characters on the ground in Afghanistan. So coming back to your introduction, I don't think there are necessarily easy, clear cut final answers. There is a great deal of complexity here. Um, I hope I hope that made sense. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Muska. And um, I mean, that's raised again and sort of a, a range of different challenges from both how the international community is supporting, but also this, this challenge of how you actually capture the various understandings, the various views, and that dilemma with timelines as well, you know, trying to get something done very quickly, but at the same time, needing to take the steps um, to, to embed national ownership um, throughout. Um, so moving over to, um, to, to Elizabeth, Dr. Lace, um, I mean, we, we also heard from the Deputy Minister of the, the approach that worked in Sierra Leone around the Special Court. Um, so the challenges from Muska on what ownership actually means. Um, 
The design and implementation of programs to support security and, ju and justice sector development is, is really key to ensuring these core principles are taken into account. And how, how have you seen your approaches evolve to be able to really kind of put ownership central? And how has that understanding evolved? All right. Yeah. Thank you very much, Victoria. And thank you very much for having us on this um, very important uh, panel. Maybe allow me to focus on the security sector for this question. And uh, let me start by highlighting again why the involvement of civil society and the grassroots level in SSR security sector reform programs is important. I think the past few months have shown us once again that the state society relationship has a direct impact on the degree of uh, security and stability in the country. So besides the ability to protect, there must be the will to protect by the state, which must find its counterpart in the confidence of the citizens to be protected by the state. So the more fragile context, the more attention this relationship requires must also be reflected in SSR programs. And this is why it is important for us implementing organizations when using known instruments to involve society or citizens themselves to ensure that we live up to this claim. So how is this reflected in our programming? It starts actually with asking what are the support needs of the security um, actors and are they aligned with the security needs of the population? So we start by conducting needs assessment, bringing in also the perspective of the people, stakeholder mappings, comprehensive analysis interviews during appraisal missions. And here we might already face the first challenge since the picture is generally very heterogeneous. The priority support needs identified by the security institutions do not necessarily coincide with those identified by the population. As implementers, how do we deal with this tension? How do we ensure that when we design and implement support programs for state security actors, we do not miss the most pressing security needs of the population? One way of dealing with this dilemma is that we try to reflect diversity of stakeholder interests and needs in the selection of the program partners that means involving civil society actors right from the beginning. And that's why multi-actor cooperation frameworks and networks, networks are very important elements of our project design and implementation, but also for joint steering. For example, we have very good experience in bringing in state and non-state actors, even in the security sector together um, through our program steering committees. I can highlight that later if, if, if time um, is available. So, so much for uh, the setting up of the program partner structure. So I would now like to use the example of our multi-level approach to show how we design the intervention to integrate civil society into SSR programs for connecting the grassroots level with the government decision-making level. Multi-level approach means we plan our interventions on all three state levels, national policy level, implementing institutions and municipality Municipal, municipal level with the objective of permeability between these levels. Maybe three examples. First, it's important for evidence-based and informed policy making the security sector. For example, she has said is implementing on behalf of the German government and the European Union, a program supporting policies for border management regimes. For these decision-making, it is crucial that the right information is on the various causes of the conflict from the local border enters the policy making process right from the beginning. Civil society actors play a major role in mediating between the levels. And in these cases, we also apply the multi level approach to our cooperation with civil society, since people in the peripheral areas usually feel just as little representatives by NGOs from their capitals as they do by state actors. So this means we work with local NGOs that enjoy the trust of the people on ground and they then cooperate with civil society actors on national level. Very often large scale, open and very resource intensive stakeholder consultations are often carried out as part of policy processes. In our experience, this is not promising and stress state society relations. Second example, um, we apply this approach to verify the feasibility of implementation plans of national or regional policies. This is in particular important for areas such as 
combating human trafficking or SGBBE, where complex referral mechanisms and SOPs are designed at a national, sometimes even regional level, which do not necessarily coincide with the actual cooperative relationships between state and non-state actors at the local level where the crimes actually take place. A third one, we use um, the approach to identify where local problems should be solved locally. And here we have very interesting lessons learned with community policing. Um, maybe I, I go into that later on in the session. These were some few examples how we work with the civil society to reflect the cyber security needs uh, uh, of the population in and through our programming. However, I also want to at least briefly touch upon the important role of civil society in security sector oversight and transparency. In many countries, oversight and complaints mechanisms have been introduced in the security sector. We also support these mechanisms in our SSR projects we implement on behalf of the German government and the European Union. But if in a strange state society relationship, these accountability and transparency instruments are not seriously used or misused by the state, or if citizens have false expectations of these mechanisms, this can further severely damage face in state and security sector. The society can contribute to repairing the system, first in their oversight function by keeping up pressure on state actors to use the mechanism properly as using uh, evidence and, and, and data here. Secondly, in their transparency function by supporting state security actors, public awareness, but even in managing expectations. Incidentally, the side effect of this win-win approach can even um, improve the relationship between state and civil society actors. So civil society has I, a crucial role. Just to try to please. Thank yeah, you. I'm wrapping up. Um, so it has an important role to play, but it shouldn't be overburdened. I've, and that's very important for me to, to mention here, finally. Civil society advocates, human rights defenders often take significant risk when speaking up about security sector deficits. As part um, of our do no harm approach, we try to strengthen resilience of the civil society actors by increasing digital literacy and, and so on. However, we cannot offer them protection from political pressure. So which is why we invest quite a lot in identifying risks for our civil society partners from the onset of our program and how this, this works. Um, we might come to that uh, later. So, so much for the question. Thank you very much, Victoria. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. So there's a range of challenges that come up from, a, um, from an international perspective of supporting you know, sort of na national ownership. Um, and, you know, we, we've heard as well the, the range of sort of different, you know, contexts that, um, you know, sort of national ownership has, has clearly got to, um, uh, got to be carried through from, um, uh, you know, reconstruction through development to, you know, political uh, transitions. Um, and certainly, you know, there's often a tension when looking to achieve a political settlement to bring about peace between, you know, moving quickly to achieve stability and ensuring sufficient time is taken to incorporate diverse views to ensure a sustainable um, arrangement. Um, so this is one of the areas I'd, I'd like to come back to uh, Major General um, Chuck Byung Gang. Because um, we also heard from Muska this reference to reconciliation and um, the sort of these, these challenges of, um, you know, of ensuring uh, national ownership is, is maintained or is introduced and supported throughout a, a transition. So I was wondering if you, could, if you could share your views on how the integration of veterans has worked in, uh, in South Sudan um to ensure that there is this sort of wider understanding of uh, of national ownership you know how did you how did you approach the the question of how different populations understood notions of security and justice in order to develop a common vision thank you uh thank you very much uh actually uh, this question was not clear to me from the beginning but i try my level best to answer the way i understood it uh, the word veterans means the old fighters that fought a war. And our war 
was a voluntary war. And as I told you, the war that took us 21 years, uh, many young people become old. So you, you were 30 years. After 21 years, you become 51 years old. So I think uh, from 2011 up to now, it's a big gap. So for us, uh, the veterans are always screened, especially the fighters. They are screened. You take the, the young ones that are still capable of defending the country to the army, to the police, wildlife, and other organs. The elderly ones, take them to DDR. You demobilize them, integrate them into civil society. Some of them are active mentally so they can be able to continue with their civil work in these in institutions. Uh, again, you train them, give them skills so that they can be able now to acquire new skills because the skill that they know before was to, to fight and the gun. But now after demobilizing, you have to give them skills. And there is a ministry our ministry is called Ministry of Defense and Veteran Affairs. So there is Veteran Affairs, taking uh, all the necessary parts of the veterans. So the veterans are our fighters. We have to take care of them. We have to continue to give them skills so that they can be able uh, to, to cope up with the new life. So the the government initiated what is called national dialogue so that people can sit together and storm their minds and came out with resolution and recommendations. That is a key document. That is now the government is trying to adopt so that at least everybody have his own rights. Uh, in the in the government of South Sudan. So the national dialogue become now one of the documents that we respect because there is rule of law, there is human rights, there is child rights, woman rights, child abuse. They all speak out their minds and the resolution came out that we must cope up with all these resolutions as a direct a new direction to the government of South Sudan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, General. And it's, it's certainly it's, it's an impressive journey that, uh, that, that you're on. And that, that point on the, the range of voices that, that, need, to be, uh, that need to be included. Um, and I mean, just going over to the, uh, to the chat, um, there are a number of questions that have, uh, that have, come, that have come in. And one of them um, is, is asking, you know, stating that security and justice institutions are critical to reverse fragility. Um, and it's important to revise constitutions to ensure that institutions are not just uh, adjust, are transparent and representative of society. Uh, and there's often a challenge that the institutions are not democratic and not representative. So how do you, you know, how do you change that? How do you uh, make sure that that isn't the case. How do you make sure that there are that you know the constitution is 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 indeed um, uh, an overarching document to allow uh, for national ownership, and you have these transparent uh, institutions. Uh, Deputy Minister of Justice, in, um, in in your next intervention, I was wondering if you would be able to touch on that on that question of uh, of how to ensure the institutions really are you know democratic and uh, and inclusive. Um, and uh, the floor, the floor is yours, please. Um, thank you very much. Of course, um, Australia, as we all know, historically we had um, an eleven years of um, civil cloud with devastating consequences. 
lack of trust in our judiciary and security system was identified as one of the major causes of the war. The extent, uh, extent of Australian conflict demanded some form of accountability. So after the war, we decided to establish two institutions of transitional justice. That is the TRC, which was established in Sierra Leone and the Special Court. Both were operating in Sierra Leone simultaneously. Lessons learned and recommendations from both the TRC and the Special Court informed justice sector reforms in Sierra Leone. It was from the TRC recommendation that we started our conditional review process in Sierra Leone way back in 2007. And uh, we've been going through that quite recently. The government has launched an official white paper with recommendations that the government intends to accept. And that is a very progressive document and we intend to take care of most of the issues and ensure that um, we get an all inclusiveness in um, setting up the issue of access to justice in our country. We have made significant strides in our formal informal justice institutions through democratizing and effectively providing the services required um, by the citizen. For example, as far back as 2002 in Sierra Leone, the Peace and Conflict Studies Program was established at the University of Sierra Leone, which was based on the need to train security and justice sector actors alongside ex-combatants on the post-war reconstruction and peace building. Most of the modules taught that are, are based on security sector reform, traditional justice, institutional building, and post-conflict um, settings in the um, gen on gender and development. The establishment of the program has helped to increase awareness and provide trainings that have benefited thousands of policymakers and practitioners, judges, lawyers, paralegals, academics, et cetera, et cetera, in shifting to a people-centered and human security-based approach to security and justice governance in Australia. We also continue to strengthen our governance institutions like the Independent Police Complaint Board, the Human Rights Commission, the Office of National Security, the Office of the Ombudsman, and uh, recently we've also established the Office of Disaster Response Management in our country to name but a few. The work of these um, rights and accountability institutions continues to improve public confidence uh, by um, public confidence of our citizens in the justice and security sector. Additionally, in order to meet the formal and informal justice system and the needs of our people, we have increased recruitment of um, state council at the Ministry of Justice and the Attorney General's Office. We've recruited more magistrates and deployed them to each and every part of the country in the Republic of Australia so your people can have access to justice where they do not have access to it for the last 20 or 30 years. We also had more judges and more paralegals with improved condition of services. Community-based paralegal services have also been used to access justice, particularly in rural areas. National government, I mean, Australia has de deployed many governmental responsibility to local government under our devolved um, arrangement, devolved functions to local government. A major step was taken in 2004 with the devolution of responsibility in the areas of agriculture, health, education, and infrastructure to the 19 elected local council. These are continued um, up to this day, and we've been able to reduce the high dependency on central government in trying to access several amenities. Remarkably, we noticed that 80% of our population access justice through the informal justice sector mechanism. This is why we've established the Legal Aid Board, which was legislated upon by Parliament that provides legal services for the most marginalized in our communities. The board also employs paralegal services covering the entire country. We also have provisions for alternative dispute resolution mechanism, which is still which is done by the Legal Aid Board in certain disputes within communities and among individuals. We continue to embark on programs to empower local communities, women to meet over community women to mediate over petty injustice problems in their communities, as we've always commissioned studies on the harmonization of customary law and the principles to make them used at the informal justice mechanism um, tool. The dual nature of our justice system provides the flexibility of using the formal and informal justice mechanism, strengthening both formal and informal justice mechanism um, as a concerted way to contribute to the goal of access to quick and fair justice. We now have a clear opportunity with the launch of the government white paper in which the government has committed to several recommendations that was made 
by the um, conditional review committee and uh, we intend to make that all inclusive and to also make sure how best we can be able to democratize and expand this institution to meet the needs of the citizenry and ensure that the issue of justice and security uh, actually improve on to prevent conflict in our country. Thank you very much, Thank Minister. You. Yeah. I think, and so there, those national national consultations is a, is a common theme that, uh, that that I think has been um, well demonstrated for South Sudan and also for Sierra Leone, and maybe not got quite right in um, in, you know, in in the Afghanistan um, uh, context. But before I hand back over to to, to Moscow and to go to um, to Elizabeth. Um, and we've talked a little, you know, we have talked about um, the different uh, you know, frameworks that help us, you know, help us to, um, to come in and provide support. And particularly, you know, in some of the sort of transition context, the, the, uh, the capacity can be uh, reduced. So how, you know, how do you help to build up a capacity for that, you know, for that ownership? And make sure that the internationals don't come in and take, you know, and, and just bring in and impose those um, their ideas. And there's a question from the um, there's a question from from the from the audience from the chat, uh, which I think speaks very well to this, um, where um, the comment is that you know there are methods to design programs based on indigenous systems, but many donors find them too alien to you. So how you know, how do you bring that together? And I was wondering if you, if you could uh, speak to that point as well, please, Elizabeth. All right, thank you very much, Victoria. Yeah, maybe um, I'd like to highlight some, some aspects approaches building on GSI experience in, in this very complex transition context. Apparently we have to deal with three requirements, immediate need for stability, security, dispute settlement, necessity to rebuild um, state capacity and necessity to deal with the negative consequences of the conflict on peace and social cohesion. So let me start with the most pressing question, how to meet the immediate need for security, justice and dispute resolution in a transition context. One approach is use the potentials at the community level and build from there. So since security and dispute settlement is among the foremost priorities of the communities in a post-conflict situation, they themselves start building or reinforcing structures that provide immediate security and, and justice. And the dilemma associated with this situation for external actors is actually obvious. What if the structures at a local level start to conflict with institutions supported at a national or subnational now a national level? So there's no, no actually no um, easy way out. Um, so striking a balance between strengthening community structures, facilitating their linkage to state-owned security and justice institution, as well increasing le the legitimacy and authority of the latter is necessary, but difficult to attain at once. So it's about combining short-term with structure measures, linking local with national level, while paying attention to the sequencing of interventions. And that's quite a lot. So if uh, I may, I have one example how we went about it from our experience supporting the peace process in Nepal 10 years ago. There was a need to take immediate action at a local level. The police, the judiciary and the local police committees had no sufficient capacity to handle a rising conflict at an early stage. Neither were they fully trusted as they have been one of the conflicting parties. So the option that remained was to support the establishment and the capacity development of a professional pool of dialogue facilitators, as well as social dialogue groups and use peace councils comprised of ex-combatants and, and old community members as a bridging mechanism to prevent tackling, uh, to prevent and tackle conflicts and violence at local levels. These groups also promoted human rights, rights of women and children, and the women's perspective played an important role here, not only to articulate specific security needs, but also to involve women more in conflict resolution right from the beginning. So to ensure that these community groups did not replace or bypass the state structure, GS had built the capacity of these groups to establish linkages of the local authority and supported the formal registration of the community groups. And eventually most of these cases were handed over to state security structures. Importantly, this process did not occur in a vacuum, but in complementarity to progress on the political negotiations 
as well as an implement implementation of a large scale DDR process. And it took a lot of time. Coming to the justice sector, the situation is slightly different in the area of justice and dispute resolution in many countries, be they fragile or not, there are coexistence of formal, informal, traditional justice and dispute resolution mechanisms. And I would actually a bit disagree uh, with that um, development partners are shying away from it. They are often supported by um, development partners as long as certain framework conditions are in place, such as accountability, transparency, and as the deputy minister said, if they constitutionally anchored in, uh, their constitutional anchoring is, is guaranteed. Um, however, in fragile contexts, and that's what we observed, there's often a very delicate relationship between the exercise of force and the exercise of jurisdiction, of which one must be very aware of. as an external actor. And we have positive and negative examples, but I skipped them for sake of time. Um, coming to the question of rebuilding state capacity, I totally um, agree. In Muska, there's no quick fix for two reasons. There's a huge gap or brain drain of capacity due to war or wetting processes. And civil servants who remained in the office usually cling to an old understanding of state or they clash with those in ranks who belong to a new system. So indeed, if then rebuilding of capacity is only supported by external actors of the global north in kind of fast tracking procedures according to international standards and blueprints from their own historic experiences, this does not necessarily increase the willingness by the state officers to absorb new knowledge or hence trust by the people in the new system. One way the international community has found to work around this dilemma is to support regional structures and approaches that can accompany countries in transition. And she has said this is the broad partner in this endeavor. Regional organizations like okay. ECOM and coming to an end have emerged here as um, important actors, um, not only as a mediator and peacekeeper, but also with regard to common standards. Thirdly, very briefly, and this is very important, conflict and con um, context sensitive design and monitoring. I think I have to be very honest regarding the limitations and the risk. And this is why GSS context and conflict sensitive design and monitoring form actually the basis for assessing and adapting the local context in, uh, in the conceptualization planning. And Elizabeth, I'm going to have to, because uh, I'd like to give the floor back to Muska for her final points as well. So thank you very, thank you very much. Sorry to, to, to cut in there. Um, Muska, so just to keep in the, the we, we have very little time left, but um, you know, I know at the moment everyone's sort of looking at you know different contexts um, around the world, and of course you, you have experience from a very particular particular context. Um, so I just wonder if you could share some some insights. You know, what, what is the space for for national ownership in in Afghanistan in the current context? You know, what mechanisms, approaches, or attitudes or advice could you could you share with with us? Um, for that type of context. Thank you. Sure. So I think it's difficult to have a conversation about local ownership um, um, and, and access to justice without speaking to reconciliation. Uh, and, and there is unfortunately a, a circularity to conflict in Afghanistan. The repressed of yesterday have a way of turning into those who were repressed today the ranks of the Taliban swelled during the years of the Republic because of airstrikes and night raids, and now they're in control. And rhetorically, at the senior levels, um, in conversations with international stakeholders, things like inclusion, security, and if not human rights, then political justice and right relationship as conceived in Islam, these are emphasized. But just like in 2001, there is no... Con as I see it, and as far as I'm aware, there is no concrete approach or plan to deal in a restorative sense with past injustices. And my thinking is this, if you take on the mantle of statehood, if you think yourself competent, justified, entitled to do that, then it has to be about more than ideology, right? I can't generalize um, because these are contested questions, but in Afghanistan, there's a deep need to reckon with the past. Um, the lack of any observable uh, movement, movements towards a process of reconciliation, which objectively sh would be, should be in the interest of any ruler, objectively speaking, um, I think is rooted in 
um, in distrust uh, due to the very difficult relationship of the Taliban with anything to do with liberal democracy, liberal peace building, and the secular language that comes with that. Um, but that, the re but the rhetoric of um, or the language of reconciliation doesn't have to be secular. It doesn't have to be grounded in a specific intellectual tradition of thought. You can speak about human rights, but you can also speak about injustice and the restoration of, of, of right relationship. The ethics of justice at the heart of human rights are grounded in the concepts of righteousness and mercy and so on, things we find across all Abrahamic religions. And for this to mark an open door to something, there has to be flexibility from both sides. Within the liberal piece, some would say that, or from the side of the liberal piece, some would say that there is an, there is an insistence on a specific vocabulary. And I imagine that to some, this can come across as, as a form of pushiness from outside and from above. Um, and if we you know, if we for a moment um, accept that or go along with this thinking, then the leap from this to the perception of imposition is not a big one. Um, so as you can see, you know, in me just trying to give you answers, I'm sort of launching into something like a discussion, trying to weigh in and give voice to different positions. So again, I reiterate, just based on my experience from Afghanistan, there are no easy answers, but I think we come a long way when we're willing to inspect and re-inspect our assumptions about how things should be. And I think this aligns with the spirit of local ownership, with the spirit of the concept of local ownership. You, you know, to, to walk into contexts with an intellectual openness um, in, in limited geographic uh, pockets, I saw this in the later years of the Republic, towards the uh, towards the end of the life of the Republic, um, to put it bleakly, um, with development interventions stressing local government, local decision making bodies, sure as, um, and and more of the bottom up impulse. Um, but it should have been there. Should have been much more of that. It should have been done much earlier. Um, so um, yeah, I, I, I fear that we are, I fear at times that we are repeating the mistakes of 2001. Um, and and yeah, we're running to, to, to the end and it would, yeah, I, I would love to be able to continue on the, the, the discussion. I mean, I think in the last sort of 30 seconds, I mean, clearly um, not going to be able to sort of sum up the, the richness of the discussions, but I think key what came out, you know, is the reconciliation, the commitment to human rights, to gender, the role of civil society, the national consultation processes. I would also say the leadership that, that we've seen from the you know, Edison General, from the from the Deputy Minister, so the civil society, the grassroots support, and um, that sustainability of support and uh, and sequencing. Um, so, if I can just thank my my panelists, to um, Major General Chol Bill Nang, to Deputy Minister Omar Napoleon Kuroma, to Muska Deskede, and Elizabeth Rice. Thank you very much. It's been a great discussion. Mm -hmm.